I would like to give a talk on integrating the carer experience for optimal delirium care. My name is Dr. Shibli Rahman, and I'm an honorary research fellow at the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences at UCL London. I'm also a special advisor in disability at NHS Practitioner Health. I am myself disabled. I'll try to speak as clearly as I can. This subject matters an enormous amount to me because a few years ago, my mum started developing recurrent delirium in hospital, for which she had a steady but progressive cognitive decline. This has therefore become a labour of love for me to find out as much as I can about it. The learning objectives of this talk are to introduce you to the importance of the carer to acu acute hospital care in delirium. Don't worry if you don't know much about delirium. In fact, it can go under the radar for many. I should like to first of all say I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. These include Daniel Davis, without whom I wouldn't have had access to resources to learn more about delirium. Alistair McLulick. Alistair McLulick is Professor of Geriatrics at the University of Edinburgh at the Usher Institute. And in the front here is Professor Sharon Inui, a world-respected leader, as indeed the other two are in delirium. Professor Inui is at Harvard. And no lesser than these three people is the person on my right, my mother, without whom I would not be alive and for whom I do all, everything today. And it is my honor. Paradoxically, I'm thinking about my mum, the person rather than the diseases. And I'm not the only one. The reason I have problems with things like faulty units or dementia streams is that I don't think we should define people as conditions. Professor Mary Tonetti, in a very well-known article, wrote about the end of the disease era. And there are uh, differences between a disease-oriented approach and an individual approach. And I won't read out the differences, but they're evident in this table. Before I talk about persons and care, there are two factoids about persons and care, which I would like to mention. First of all, well-being is not just the absence of well-being. And similarly, Good care is not just the absence of bad care. So what's a person? Well, it seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? But you can abolish the identity, identity of a person in various ways, such as sleep or temporal lobe epilepsy or hypoglycemic coma. And of course, delirium and dementia are well-known causes of cognitive impairment and behavioral changes. So it seems like a good idea, doesn't it, to focus on the person, but what else would we focus on? Alternatives include the family or relationships. Now, do we actually mean centered? We could be led or empowered, but um, there's a semantic uh, issue here. Aspects mechanistically of personalized care include perhaps budgets, care and support plans, care at home or in care homes, 
the GP primary care consultation, and of course the big one, discharge planning. And the culture is regulated. Here's an example, Health and Social Care Act 2008, Regulated Activities and Regulations 2014, Regulation 9. In other words, organisations can be judged on their ability to deliver person-centred care. For me, as a carer and as a qualified doctor on the medical register, I should like to say I take my carer duties extremely seriously. I'm a carer, but I have to interact with professionals. I cannot look after my mum medically. I transfer power to professionals. And it's not a truthful thing whether I am empowered as a carer. There's an argument we should banish the word empowerment. Uh, in fact, the reason for this is that it implies a power imbalance. If somebody is being empowered, is somebody else doing the empowering and why are they so important? So I believe that to progress, we need co-production with carers and patients. This means that we have a model of leadership which is different from a hierarchical one. We have a distributed leadership model. And this can be enforced, if that's the right word, locally with people, not being done to people. So basic issues, one for a carer. Well, a carer, if you get a correct cooperative history, will point you in the direction of the actual diagnosis. This is fundamental in certain types of dementia. In fact, all of them, including dementia of lean body type, behavioral found frontotemporal dementia, the latter, where profound personality and behavioural changes will point you to the diagnosis if it's progressive over time. You will not get the history from the patient, him or herself, because he or she may not have insight. Other issues include shared decision-making, involvement in care, I mean care planning, discharge planning, Continuity of care is well known fact that problems in care often occur at the cracks or the boundaries of care, transfers in between care locations. And of course, prevention of further episodes. A carer is probably the first person able to see a difference in the person being cared for and therefore is at the vanguard. And it, it's essential that he or she can communicate this to a health professional, often in an, an emergency. Delirium is incredibly distressing. I found it awful as a carer, watching my mum turn into somebody totally different, and I could not understand it, and nor could anyone else. And delirium is distressing for the person involved because of vivid nightmares, hallucinations, illusions, but it's also distressing for the carer who is not given information, is not explained what is going on, is not told when it will all end, is not told what the outcomes will be. So it's incredibly distressing. And I would not wish this on anyone, actually, which is why... I'm so motivated to uh, tell other people about delirium. It is a medical emergency. When I qualified in 2001 from Cambridge, it was known as the acute 
confusional state. Now, it was taught to me it was reversible, everyone recovers fully from it, and it's a pretty benign, innocuous event. Not true. It has a lot of really awful outcomes and can be recognised by the simple question, is mum herself today? There is, as such, not really an acute change in dementia, or there might be under certain circumstances, say in vascular dementia, where something suddenly changes overnight. But if mum changes in thinking and in behavior, think delirium. There were huge benefits from allowing a carer's account. When first proposed in an article in 1958, delirium was framed as a syndrome of cerebral insufficiency. This may turn out to be correct in terms of what we understand about the biology of the energetics of the brain. However, it's important to know that we've lived with delirium for thousands of years. It existed at the times of Galen and Hippocrates. But certain fundamental issues and schisms still appear in care. For example, Bed 23, not Ethel, not Doris, not Mabel. Uh, I'll stop using these uh, names, uh, stereotypical names, Jane or Angela. My need a friend from. Not bed 23 needs a run for, or bed 21 needs a bed fan, or bed 14 needs a, a candle. As a carer, things which were going wrong became very obvious to me in delirium care. And it never appeared on the discharge summary, despite guidelines, signing, sign, or nice. I was not even asked about what she could do before in terms of continence or walking or eating or drinking. Her function dropped off a cliff and therefore I would have hoped a medic would have wanted to know about it. They didn't. Mum's call bell was never answered. Given she had never been incontinent before and could not communicate her needs. This is significant. And in fact, these things rarely get reviewed. She spent a week totally in bed and couldn't walk at the end of it. So despite all the rhetoric, the reality was very grim. So think to Lewin, please, if you do come across this scenario, not uncommon, and think it isn't being pleasantly confused, think something may be abnormal. If it's bright, the windows are open, it's very loud, and the person is still fast asleep. What does it feel like uh, to be experiencing delirium? Well, uh, it's hard to describe unless you experience delirium. Here, here is a list of some suggested experiences. The problem is that there is no such thing as basic care, but fundamental care can be compromised by overworked staff being rushed off their feet. Take the drug round. Now, in fact, what happened here was that Mom's hypoactive delirium, in other words, sleeping all the time, looked a lot like end of life. Also, she stopped eating and drinking. Therefore, it was decided she would not have any medications during her hospital stay. This makes sense. She's also fell. Therefore, you would want to de-prescribe her medications, perhaps, because you would want to eliminate side effects. But the fact she was missed out on the drug round was not communicated with me. 
I thought the consultant had given up on her, and that was the impression I got, which added further to my distress. And it's frustrating to watch your own mother being denied having the polythene of her dinner being taken off. Therefore, pejoratively, it is said patient refused only because the tray was miles away from her. Nobody took the polythene off and nobody wanted to help her eat or prompt her to eat. This is simply unfair to people with cognitive impairment. The acute admission is very stressful for everyone involved. I think it's one of the hardest parts of medicine in Toto. And there were lots of reasons for this. Busy wars, lots of noise, rapid turnover of staff, people culturally not wanting to introduce themselves by name. Well, this could be because certain people are paranoid about being being complained about, perhaps. People being taken off for investigations and procedures at random times. Ward rounds at random times of the day with carers absent. Dehumanizing behaviors. In other words, patients being kept in bed in pajamas, no mobile phones, no functional internet. And we have to think human words. Think what happens if you have a hyperactive patient and they're very hyperactive and they get their arms stuck in the barrier. Think also about the inappropriate use of antipsychotics in dementia or delirium. There are instances when you might, uh, a doctor rather, might rapidly tranquilize somebody. But actually, this is difficult from a human rights perspective. It's a food that everyone has human rights who's a human. They are universal and inalienable. Therefore, the human rights does apply and things like dignity does apply. If you abolish personhood, is a slippery slope to abolishing respect and dignity. So providing high quality care is difficult. I would like now to go on to some of the research that may be relevant to this. Bearden et al. 2018, produce uh, elegant synthesis where they found four strands of care, patient care, staff interactions, the care situation, and the hospital environment. In other words, dementia-friendly wars are not just about the decor. O'Keefe and Levan, 1997, describe the poor prognosis of delirium. This is well known. And of course, when COVID started hitting the van last year, this became a big issue. So much so I took a finger to keyboard to write a piece with Kit Barrett for Age and Aging about the need for follow-up services for delirium after COVID. Why? Because often after delirium, irrespective of the etiology, there's incomplete recovery. And of course, episodes of recurrent delirium could produce cognitive impairment. I knew that from my mum a few years ago. And probable delirium could be a presenting symptom of COVID in fell older people, maybe due to direct effects on the brain or the lung, hypoxia, uh, medication, polypharmacy, comorbidity. Anyway, he came out top in lots of surveys around the world as the biggest cause of delirium. COVID, that is. So we need to look at the interaction between family carers and staff 
to make sense of it. Why are family cows so disenfranchised? What goes wrong? So here's the paper, and family cows uh, have described the challenges of being with a person with dementia and described not in being with them, but in caring for them. Now, hospital admission can lead to disruption of caring routines and is perceived by many people, including me, as a crisis, even worse, is seen as a failure of care at home. Of course it isn't, but that's why I view it. View it. If somebody needs to go to hospital, it feels very much as if I failed. And contrary to popular belief, hospital admission does not provide respite for the carer. The carer, like me, goes home and is wondering whether he or she will receive a call late at night to say their loved one has passed away. Uh, tragic, but true. And older people's experiences in acute care settings must be described and must be addressed. And this, of course, matters to whether you're in ambulatory care, acute care, CAMS, any care setting. And the problem with delirium or dementia is that people can't easily speak for themselves. So the carers have quite a big role in the care outcomes. And this communication process has to be two-way to and from carers. And poor communication can occur from the point of admission to discharge. And culturally, it does feel as if carers are ignored. This has recently been turned around a bit uh, with carers being allowed to visit wards uh, for example, John's campaign, but John's campaign, but this took a reverse step during COVID. Of course, we know in hospital visiting and care home visiting, and being confused can attract a lack of dignity and respect. And if a patient is being aggressive, and uh, physically aggressive or rude, it can be difficult to care for them. But people have rights, and of course, you could take a totally risk averse approach by abolishing risk altogether. Look at this cartoon somebody's lying on the floor to abolish a risk of falling. Now, when a person gets discharged, the approach is to um, do a very risk averse approach. So discharge somebody with a frame or hoist. But you have to think about what, where's the carrot going to put them? Or if a carrot is going to be trained, how to use them? And what if function, function recovers so that the person no longer has to use them? Then what? So uh, there's been a philosophy of trying to get people home, and I fully agree with this. It can be a cause of premature transfer to gowns, which probably does save the country a lot of money, but does put a lot of uh, pressure on other people. I've written a book called Essentials of Delirium, thanks to Professor McGullick and Professor Inui for writing the introductions. I've written on various topics in Jerry's as well, and Delirium Damage is part of the blueprint for geriatrics. And in fact, my book with Henry Woodford will be out in August. 
21, if you want to read it, and has some questions on delirium and dementia in the single best answer format. Here are Adam and Alistair and me. And if you want to follow me on, on Twitter, at Dr. Underscore Shibley. Thank you for listening.